Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect results, so that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. We're going to do an interactive Bible study, and by that I mean I've put some of the information on your paper. <coughs> there's a pew in the, in the, if you don't have a pencil with you, there's one in the pew, and I'm going to ask you to interact with this lesson. And I'll tell you why, and then we'll have a word of prayer. <coughs> Classroom is about perception of the Word of God. It's where you perceive the Word of God. And there are three, there are three important principles of how to study the Bible in class. Okay? And this, is, this would be true in grammar school or, or high school or college. You need to interact with the information three ways. And I'll show you where in the Bible in a moment where it says it. Eye, ear, contact. That's one. Eye, ear. For example, if somebody cannot hear, he's got eyes to see and perceive right. If somebody's blind, he's got hearing, he still has got it. If he loses both of them, he's got to have help, doesn't he? He's got to have assistance. <laughs> but with those two things, he can manage his life. That's one area. That's a perception. In other words, how you receive the word of God is either through the eye or the ear. And where it's directed to go is your mind. So what I'm going to ask you to do in interaction, what you do is you do the eye-ear study and the hand. The hand contact with, with information is very important. That's why good teachers make you take notes. A good teacher makes you take notes. She writes on the blackboard. She writes on the blackboard. She gives visual aids. They give you textbooks with pictures, diagrams. And they also make you take notes. Because they understand a basic principle of learning, eye, ear, hand, contact with information. That's interaction. And where it's directed is the mind. So let me show you something. Especially if you're a teacher, you probably know this, but you might not know that that information's in the Bible. The Bible says this is a way you study, interactive with information you need to learn. Here it is. In 1 Corinthians, a second chapter, verse 9 and 10. Now, this is for the church classroom. And he's going to quote uh, here in verse 9 a passage out of Isaiah 64, 4. This is a quote out of the Old Testament, which shows this is a lifelong principle of learning. Things which the eye has not seen, and the ear is not heard, and which is not entered the heart of man, that God has prepared for those who love him. So he's talking about perception. There has to be a point of perception for learning. Learning takes place in the mind, and the mind transfers it to your life's principle or your heart. You apply, you apply that you learn things in your mind, and you apply them out of your heart. And perception is the first line of learning. Ears, let ears, ears to hear and eyes to see, the hand to take the notes that are important to your life. You know, it's interesting as a teacher, <clears throat> once you give a test and you've told them how they're to learn in your classroom, you give a test, now they really understand that. Because Part of your test, at least one-third of your test, is going to come from classroom notes. If you want them to learn what you got to say, a third of their grade is going to come from And once they get the test back and they go like, well, I didn't understand. I know you didn't take notes in class, and a third of your grade comes from it. Then you learn something, and the teacher's taught you something, even though she may have not explained it to you. And maybe you won't learn it till you get to college how important that principle is. Eye, ear, hand to mind contact. And then you have a chance to shift it into a faith-based operation in your life. So 
this is the way we're going to do an interactive study to make sure that you understand how the processing of learning goes. And today, we're going to do the eye and the ear and the hand contact with the information because I want you to see it. And the Lord will test you. I don't have to test you on whether you're getting it or not. The Lord will test you. He'll run a test through you, and you go like, I'm not prepared for this. And he'll I know, I know, I know. So what are you going to do? Well, I don't know. So I'm going to help you with that uh, today. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. Notice verse 10 says, and that's where we're going. And, well, I lost it, but in, in uh, Colossians, the second chapter, I turned, my, I turned back to my lesson guide. Here's verse 10. For to us, those who have eyes to see and ears to hear and a mind to believe, a, a mind and a heart, for to us, God revealed them through the Holy Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. That's a pretty powerful idea. And so the whole process starts in classroom gets into the mind, goes into the heart. You know why it's important for it to get? Listen, if you've got a good teacher, that kid is going to pull that stuff taught in the 7th, 8th grade in the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th. You know where he's going to pull it from? He's going to pull it from his heart. You know what he's done? He's taken it into his life seriously, and he's ready to advance. He's able to go into advanced subject matters and do well. And when he, and when he gets to the, the college level and beyond, He's learned a real key to knowledge and learning and excelling in his life. Okay. Uh, the advantage we have here in the church is the Holy Spirit transfers information at light speed. If you think the computer's fast, it's slow compared to the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, a, it's no way to compare those two, the light speed in which he operates. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get into our morning study, how to learn the Word of God interactively. Let us pray. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest. The etiquette uh, for classroom learning is to be sure there's no unconfessed sin in your life so the Holy Spirit can minister the Word of truth, both on the perceptive side and the comprehension side, ready for you to apply it to life and a learning experience of growth. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, that could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. If we confess them, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I give you a moment in your priesthood to take care of business, and then we'll close this part in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way by automobile and by Internet. We pray classroom etiquette would, that we apply here to the classroom would be applied to every classroom, no matter how far away, even to the uttermost parts of the earth. The principle is simple, Father. The ministry of the Holy Spirit will, through perception, take the Word of God, place it into the mind, process it there, and shift it by faith over to the heart. It is here where God becomes the reality of the life of every one of us, in our human existence, where we come to know you, Father, not as some awesome God that sets out there in judgment, but rather a loving daddy. We, we come to realize how important that is to our personal life. We have access to daddy all the time through the work of his son, and we're so thankful for that. We're thankful, Father, that confession of sin reminds us that we're still a child, and need the Father's care. And when we confess our sin, we're back into fellowship with the Father. And the ministry, this great ministry of the Holy Spirit in the church age under the new covenant is just a phenomenal thing. He will take us into the depths of the character of God. You know, we can set and we can learn, Father, your essence. But being able to sense the reality of it in our relationship with you in our life is just awesome. We pray that today over the congregation that is here as well as those that are at distance. For we made our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, today we're going to look at this interactive Bible study, and so I want you to participate with me. There are things that I want you to participate with me by listening, uh, by observation on your paper, and at point at some point writing, and it's important for you to participate. It's very important that you participate. Okay, this is an exercise, and it's important. Point number one, when we read our text, we begin with verses 2, 3, and 4. There are two commands. There are two commands. We've talked about this previously. There are two commands. The first command that's given you just dominates the idea of what the writer is saying. Consider it all joy. Consider it all joy. And that's the first command. And a command should dominate, but actually the key to this tells you consider it all joy. Look at this in verse 2. Consider it. Well, i got to get back to my text. Consider it all joy. Let me get back to James. When. Notice that. When. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when. The key word to consider it all joy as, as a beginning stage of explaining how you... Listen, you see the word all? See, most of us never do that. Most of us consider some things joyful and other things not joyful. That's not what his goal is. His goal in this lesson is for you to reach a place in your life where you can consider no matter what it is, enjoy. Right? Consider it what? All. So you ought to circle that word all. Because most of us never buy into that concept. And it is a command. It's not optional. He's not asking for your opinion about it. It's an aorist imperative. It's a very strong command. Consider it all joy. In other words, when you get into undeserved suffering, into undeserved suffering, which bothers people the worst, when it's deserved, they got guilt, and they got, yeah, yeah, well, I, I had it coming to me. But the undeserved, this is where you begin to challenge your faith. You begin to challenge the character of God. You challenge everything. Consider it all joy. And when he says all, he means when you're at the beginning stage of undeserved suffering, when you're in the middle of it, and when you're at the end of it, he, that's what he means by all. Okay? That's what he means by all. Now, the key word is when. The key word is when. The writer establishes it with Houghton, H-O-T-A-N. When you have Houghton, you have a subjunctive. And it could be translated whenever. Whenever this occurs. And what he's talking about in context is undeserved suffering. When you fall in, when, now watch this, when you what? Notice on your paper, write what follows after when. When you what? Fall into diverse King James or various New American Standard temptations or trials or testings. That's what he's talking about. Did you write that out of your paper? Well, let me tell you something. You're going to fall in. My grandfather, when we finally got electricity first thing my grandmother wanted was a bathroom because we had an outdoor John I don't know why they called him John but they could have called a guy that's where my grandfather spent all this time that was his name 
Well, we got an inside. My grandfather in the summer times in Michigan still loved that. That's where you'd find my grandfather. He didn't like the indoor one. He liked the outdoor one in the summer. Now, he liked it in the winter. Well, after several years of that sitting out there and grandmother complaining, get rid of the outdoor John. Because it wasn't very far from the house, right? You understand? On Halloween one night, the Schultz boys and I got the idea on the way home from a Halloween dance at Shelby High School that when we stopped, we tipped my grandfather's toilet, John over. And it would force him, and we'd have a little fun. Grandma would get her wish because it's tipped over. Let's move it. It's ready to go. And we would have a little fun. Just tip it over. Don Schultz was a great big tall guy, six feet, which was big in my day. That was like Goliath. He was like a 6'1 guy, really skin, skinny guy, tall, skinny guy. He got on one corner, the three Schultz boys, we didn't take the younger ones, they were too young to go with us, high school kids, and we tipped it over. A nail was sticking out on the corner, caught Don, and pulled him into the hole. As it was going over, he was going in. That's what you call falling in. That's peripepto. That is the word falling in to various testings. When the toilet hit the ground on the door side, I heard a, uh, and is that you, Ronnie? My grandfather was into John. I went, yeah. Just with a calm, wonderful grandfather voice said, tip it back up and let me out. But we couldn't do that right away, Grandpa, because Don was sinking deep in you know what. So when I hear the word peripepto, I think of Don Schultz and what Don Schultz fell into. That is the word falling into various kinds of testing. That is what we are talking about here. An example in the Bible would be Job, other than my grandfather, would be jo or Don, would be Job or Paul. Uh, Al taught wonderfully on that the other day. You see, all of that's introduced by the word when. Consider it all joy. Now, that was pretty hard. I guarantee you, Don, it took him a while. In fact, we nicknamed him. I know. He carried that name among us all through high school. We nicknamed him. When... Consider it all joy when you fall into temptation or testing. The word testing is perosmos. Perosmos is an interesting word, and I explained it to you the other day, and it's well worth you understanding this. Let me explain it educationally to you one more time. You do well enough in high school to get into college. You take pre-law. You have to do well enough to go into law. So you've done well enough in high school to get into college. You've done well enough to get through pre-law for. Now you've gone accepted into law school, and you've done well there, and you've got a degree. 
That's perirosmos. This is the testing that goes along in a progression taking you to, to goals. A goal to get out of high school, a goal to get into pre-law, a goal to get into law school, and you have your degree. But you and I both know there's more to come if you want to practice law. But Perry Rosmos is going to stop there with the goal that you've got to now pass a bar exam. Perry Rosmos would go on to that because it's progressing you along, growing you along to get to an ultimate goal. And each stage you have a goal. You, you graduated from high school. You graduated from college. You graduated from law school. Now you've got the bar exam. And Perry Rosmos is all the testing and all that's involved to reach a goal that puts you into a, a, st a better stage, right? I mean, each stage is a growing stage, agreed? That's, and that's the secret. Each of them is a growing stage to take you to a goal. Each of these testing stages of periosmos is going to take you to dokimas, a goal. You've reached a goal, a an approval to move you forward. You go through, through pre-law. Going through all that four years is periosmos, but when you graduate from there, reaching forward, that's dokimas. You go to law school. Periosmos is taking you through all the struggles to get there with a goal to graduate. And so it goes. Do you understand that? And these words are used in our, our text. Periosmos. This temptation. I want you to show it. I want to show it to you in Peter. Hold your place in James. Now, you see, I, I can't tell you what all to write. But I, I do tell you, you ought to be writing something. I can't, I, you know, I don't know. Right now, you think you can remember it, but two weeks from now, you can't. That's why you write it down. I'm in 1 Peter uh, 1, 6 and 7. Listen to this. In this, you greatly rejoice. See the word rejoice? That's the same word as joy in the verb. Joy is a noun, kara, and rejoice is the verbal form, karizo. In other words, it's an action word. It is, it is joy within your soul, activated and working. It's called rejoicing. That's joy active. That's the joy active in your life. Here's what he says, verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various parasmas. In other words, there are periods, even though you have a, a goal and are qualified to enter into reaching that goal, it's not necessarily easy. And the farther you go towards your ultimate goal, the tougher it gets. High school, pre-law, law, bar exam. Then you get to practice law, which is a whole nother ball game. What field? How's it go? Now you're back into a goal setting and on the way you march through life. This is a continuum in your life. Verse 7, watch this. If necessary, you have been distressed by various parasmases that the proof of your faith, see, this is, what, this is what builds muscle towards your goal, that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result, that's a key idea, to result in praise, glory, honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Pretty powerful stuff right there, people. Did you write down 1 Peter 1, 6, and 7? Yes. Oh, good. See the proof of your faith? Look at see the See the word proof of your faith in, in, first, in 1 Peter 1, 6, and 7? See the proof of your face? <laughs> face? Faith? That word proof? Dokimas. Dokimas. 
See, he showed the same principle. Parasmas moving you towards your goal. You reach that goal. That's, a, that's only one stage of it, but that's dokimas. You reach that. <laughs> Joy. <laughs> now we're moving forward. Parasmas. Dokimas. <laughs> your family comes out to high school graduation. They come out to college graduation. They go out to law graduation. They hold their breath till you pass the bar. Because we're a struggle if we don't make that, right, after all this. You talk about mucho money. Besides the disappointment might come, but that, and look, this can be very stressful. Parasmas can be very stressful, but the goal is always out there in front of you. The goal is dokimas. You know, the carrot. It's wonderful. Here's the second thing. There's a second key word that's very important. Remember, to count it joy, you're going to go through some stuff. In the beginning, when you're going through high school, can you still call it joy? When you're going through pre-law, can you call it joy? Uh, well, listen, keep your attitude about joy. Keep your attitude there. That's, that's the attitude. Count it all joy. That's your attitude. It don't matter how tough it gets. What should my attitude be? Distressed, Ron. I'm distressed. I know. Consider it joy. How is that possible? Because you're in the plan of God working towards a goal that's going to be wonderful. You're always there. That, and listen, this is what God's right to talk to you about your Christian life. A second key word associated with counting it joy is knowing. See the word knowing? That's ganasco. Ganasco. That's really important. It's a present active participle. And ganasco refers to knowing something well enough to apply it. And if you ganasco, here you're going, you're going through rasma, you know, peri rasmas, you're going through these trials and testings to reach a goal. We see the knowing is important because it's preparing you for life. It's preparing for the next stage that's coming, the next phase to your life. The Word of God is always, always testing, working, building, moving, pushing to another goal that's high, at a higher level of more responsibility and more blessing. Always pushing. That's the point of spiritual growth maturity. Always pushing you to a higher goal. The ultimate goal is going to be made in the image of Christ. The ultimate goal is this whole thing is about transformation. I've been transferred. Listen to me. I've been transferred from a high school student to a college student. I've been transferred from a college student to a law student. I've been transferred from a law student past the bar. I am now a lawyer. And then there are, there are goals within that. Do you understand that? Knowing. Knowing. Knowing is saying, I know, I understand the processing. I understand the processing. I understand well enough. Listen, the fact that you graduated from high school and qualified to go to college, you can whip it. You can reach your goals. If your goals, if one has led you to the second, the second to the third, and the third to the fourth, it is developing, it is developing from one to another, to another, to another. It's all about developing you. That's why we study the Bible. That's the way we study it, the way we study it in this church. We don't fluff you, give you a, a, an emotional something you can attach to and go out and fall on your face and don't, don't know how to get back up. The second key word to count and all joy is knowing. Knowing something well enough to be able to apply it, to move forward in your growth, in your maturity, and your goal orientation. Knowing what? Knowing what? Watch this. See the word that? 
Look at this now in your text. Knowing that, that's like count it all joy. When? This is knowing that. Hote is a declarative. It's a declarative. And listen, it's very important. Hote, when it follows a verb of knowing, it is declaring exactly what you exactly got to know. Exactly. Take these two pills. Take them three times a day. Take them for four days. And then give me a call if you're not better. Exact. Knowing what? Introduced by a declarative conjunction. That after a verb of knowing. What is it? What is the being declared? Now look at your text and write it. What's being declared? It's so essential to your life. What's being declared? Watch this now. Watch what's being declared. Here's what's being declared. That the testing of your faith produces endurance. Do you see that? That the testing, we've just looked at that word, that the testing of your faith, whose faith? Your neighbors, your parents, your pastors. The Father, our Heavenly Father is taking pictures. That, just calm down, it's all right. Lights going on in offices, picture taking. The declarative, knowing what? That the testing of your faith, what, what are we going through? We've just fallen into undeserved suffering. We've just fallen into, right? Temptations. Knowing that the testing, the processing, is of your faith. What do you believe? How much do you believe it? It's not dependent on you. Your faith is not dependent on you. It's dependent on God. Your faith leans on him. It doesn't lean on you. It leans on him. Do you know that? Do you know that your faith is to be exercised and it develops character and helps you reach your goal? Did you know that? And you know what faith is in? Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God, so that God, you can understand that my faith activates God's work to accomplish the goals in my life that he, is, that he has set. It produces. Notice that the testing of your faith produces something better. It's your testing is not for testing. The testing is for your faith so that your faith can produce something that moves you forward in your life, not backwards. This word producing is an interesting word because it has kata on the front of the word er, ergazomai. Ergazomai is a verb of work. A verbal form of work, which means the activity of the work. What are you doing? I'm shoveling. I'm trying to get Don out of a mess. And kata is added onto the front of it that develops the divine norms and standards that is important for the activity of God working your faith in the midst of your diversities. I am distressed. That's okay. That's okay. Because God is developing your life, moving you towards a higher goal. Therefore, knowing that the testing of your faith is in high productivity. It's kata. It's in high, it's, it's in high gear. Pushing you forward. And the word patience or endurance, hupomone, hupomone, is the word patient endurance. I don't think I can take any more of it. I know, 
Here's what I want you to do. Repeat after me. Count it all joy. I'm not asking you to do it. I'm telling you this person says, I can't take it, Ron. I can't take it. Ron, I can't take it one more day. I mean, I can't take it. I can't take it. Lord, take it off from me. Lord, take it off from me. Lord, take it off from me. No. What? I'm Paul. What do you mean don't take? What? what, what no. Why? Knowing that the grace of God is sufficient, you haven't learned it. You teach it and you know it, but you haven't learned it. I'm teaching it to you. I'm teaching it to you. I'm teaching you hands on. This is hands on. I'm going to teach it to you hands on. It's going to be the best. Come on, Bubba. It's going to be okay. I'm not going to answer your prayer that way. I'm going to answer, but not that way. But I'm going to come down and put hands on you to teach you an important principle that people have got to hear from you. They're getting generic grace. They're not getting realistic grace. They're getting it generic. Grace is God. I'm not talking about coining it out. I'm talking about living it out. You've got grace coined, but you don't have it dynamically lived. We're gonna, I'm going to show you how to teach you people how to live grace in the midst of great struggling. And boy, did he ever. Hands on. There comes a point in your life and my life where it becomes hands on. Should be that all the time in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But sometimes in the midst of our growth, we get a little arrogant having just graduated from college with a 5.0. Or a guy like me had an 05. Just graduated, get out the door. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces the energetic work of God in your life. It puts God into high speed in your life. That's the word producing. And it produces patience. Why? To count it all joy. Patient endurance. You know what that, you know what we call that? Waiting. <laughs> yeah, Psalms 27, 14, waiting. What you waiting on? Oh, I'm waiting on, listen, I don't know what you're waiting on, but Joy's waiting on God. God may wait, but he's what? Never late. He may wait, but he's never late. That's a Hortonism. Testing of your faith. If you saw Kata or Gozamai in a gym, you would go like, holy catfish. I get tired watching him. That would be my grandson, Ty, in a gym right now. He lifts everything they got and then goes out in the parking lot. Bulking up, getting that swagger, walking in a room with swagger. You remember those days? Oh, girls, you know about swagger, too. We call it swaying. Boys got it. And you girls got it, too. Hoopo Monet. Write what we know that undeserving produces in order that we can count it all joy. Patient endurance. See, there's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's an end. Patient endurance is in that middle when it just looks like I'm not going to get a reprieve. I'm not going to get any. What's going on, dear God? What's going on? Training. I'm developing you into something you couldn't even imagine in your own heart. In your greatest day of ambition, you could never imagine where I'm going to take you. Sweetheart, you have no idea, but listen, you just be, you listen, you patiently endure what I am. I am actively engaged in developing you where I want you to go. I have created you for this goal and purpose in life. Holy 
catfish people. Why wouldn't you want that? Why wouldn't that? Why wouldn't you want that? And so you go through this stuff, and instead of whining and saying, let me out, let me out, let me out. Why not know that knowing that this is working in my favor, developing me towards a goal that God has for me, why am I on earth? Why am I on earth? Wouldn't it be nice to have that answered in your life before you die? The only person preventing that is you. Ever since you got born again, God has been pushing you. And listen, he was working in your life before you got born again pushing you. Just not interactively. Working situations and everything in your life to get you where you are. You know what happened with Paul? When you read 2 Corinthians, we've talked about this, 2 Corinthians 12, when you look at verse 10, you see what the goal was. Going through it, he says, I'm going to teach you that my grace is sufficient. That He taught him that going through the process. You know what the goal was? Verse 10. You know what Paul said? I have learned to be content. No matter what. And he, he describes it. I am well content for Christ's sake that when I am weak, I am strongest. You know why? Because God is actively engaged in my life, pushing me forward to bring me into the transformation of the image of God's Son and, and the divine purpose for my being on earth. You know, it's one thing to send the divine Son. The other thing was get the divine Son to push the agenda all the way to the end, right? And the son can climb on the cross and say, I voluntarily do this for my father. This is why I've been brought into the world. This is my creative purpose. Do you know what that is? How is that possible that you don't know that? Have you not gone through enough suffering? You should have learned that through the first suffering session. And why would you waver once you understand what that goal in your life is? I can tell you one of that goal, one of those goals is to conform you into the image of Christ. And when he gets you on that road, he will reveal to you why you are on earth in this day, in this history, in this city, and in this church. Well, that's a good place for me to stop. We'll come back after our hour. Uh, not after. <laughs> I'll see it's your house for lunch. No. After a 15-minute break, after we take the offering and have a 15-minute break, we'll come back and we'll, we'll deal with this a little more. Interactive Bible study, trying to show you the bigger picture of what's going on with your life. And, and we'll continue this after a break. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the wonderful congregation we have here and the vision you've given us for Ford Missions. We're going to add uh, the Molinars. I talked to them. We're adding them to our list as support people. And boy, are they in the thick of it. Great ministry and just conflict. Oh, boy, the war is waging. That's how they know it's all... So we're thankful for that. We pray, Father, for the offering. It doesn't matter how much a person puts into foreign missions. God will maximize it. Only God can take a few fish and multiply it. That's us, Father. We're just bringing a few in here and letting you multiply it. We're so thankful for the concept of amazing grace. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. When we left last time, we were talking about knowing what. And he puts a declarative in there, uh, a declarative conjunction, hote, after verb of knowing, to tell you exactly what it is that he's 
that he's discussing. Point number three says the Greek grammar, and this is the second point that's important. The Greek grammar of knowing, which is a present active participle, nominative plural masculine, is another key to understanding what is behind this count it all joy. Anytime, any place, whatever's going on, count it all joy. Let me show you how this relates to knowing. For example, the present tense means that this is continuous knowledge that's working through faith. Knowledge that you've learned is now working through the faith cycle, working through the faith cycle in a specific area of categorical Bible doctrine. For example, in this case, undeserved suffering. And it is at, as, as this process is going through, as this process of suffering is going through, and, and God is activating your faith and working energetically to, to reach a goal, as we've talked about earlier, your attitude should be counted joy. Counted joy. And you're not asked, and it's a command, which means it's not how about how you feel. See, most people count it joy when they feel good, and when they don't feel good, it's not joy. But this is a command. It's not based on how you feel. It's a, it's a command. It's, it's how you think. It's a, a, it's a command to count. Hageomai is an interesting word in itself. The word count, the King James version of this word, the New American says consider. And what it's talking about is considering different things that you can, get, can add up. Count it, add it up. You got one, two, three, four, five. Is that all? Well, wait a minute. Is that all? No. One more. Six. Is that all? Yeah. Well, then we've counted it all. Do you see the word? So what should our response be? Joy. Kara, this mental attitude thinking of grace. Kara, a mental attitude, a joyful mental attitude of thinking grace, which means God's in control, you're not. Don't worry about it. God's still on his throne. He's still operating. Make sure he's on yours. That's, that's the present tense. The active voice is volitional and it this is the idea of while this is going on beginning middle end maintain a positive attitude that God is working this God Romans 8 28 that God is working everything in your life for good now let me tell you sometimes that can really get tough when you lose somebody you really love that died unexpectedly was pulled out of your world unexpectedly we call it gut checking that's a gut check at it well, if you've had it you know what I'm talking about and you know what I find interesting that no matter how many times you go through it within that perimetry of good close friends or family you don't get desensitized. Isn't that interesting? I've never seen it. You do with it when it's outside. You can get desensitized. Desensi you know, they say all this killing and all that. Pretty soon you get desensitized. It doesn't, that doesn't happen when it's in-house. Because there's so much attached to it with God working in your life. The active voice is to remain positive. We call it positive visioning. The active voice in the present tense means no matter what's going out in front of you, keep stable inside. No matter how things are going on the outside, keep stable inside. And when I take, take that, I mean, I mean even physical disabilities. It's all out there. Remain positive. God is working all things together for good to those who love him. God is working this, and it's the truth of God that triumphs in your life. God is working all this thing. Look, look, look. I know it's tough. Listen, I know it's tough, but I also know it's good. 
And see, that's part of this thing. You know, kids go like, I don't think I want to go back to school. It's too tough. Well, too tough in what way? Well, I have to get up at 8 o'clock and go to school. That's not tough. If we're talking about subject matter, maybe we had to look at curriculums. Maybe we had to look at different careers. But tough? Depends on what, what we're talking about. Remain positive to truth because truth is what is sets you free. The truth. When, when God began, you see, faith comes out. And you know what faith is? Faith is the, is the, the knowledge of the truth. Faith, faith works all of this stuff out. You step back. When you step back from the episode of where your faith is being applied to what's going on in your life and is very distressful, you step back. You step back from that, and truth speaks to your soul. If you can just step away from it for just a moment, just step away from it for a moment and ask yourself, Father, what's going on? He will speak the truth to your heart and settle it down. You step back into it. This is one of the reasons when I have funerals, when I do funerals, I always meet with the family before we go out and do the service. Because they've gone through everybody saying, oh, I'm so sorry and all that, and you, and at the casket and all that. It just gets so crazy and exhausting. You step back here and go like, look, let's come back to a point of reality. Let's step, back, let's step away from this for a moment, and let's step back here with God for a moment. Now, we're going to go out here, and we're going to honor what God has done through Jesus Christ that we can celebrate the death of somebody because they're not here. They're with the Lord. Truth. And the principle, see, that's a present active participle. The participle is... It, it is focusing a participle and a present act of participle is focusing on something that is occurring in your life, focusing on a specific doctrine that's really, really important. And you know where it may be very important? Three or four points on that doctrine before it settles down in your soul. I got it. I'm not just talking about a concept. I'm talking about a doctrine where you go like point one, point two, point three, and by the time you get to point four, then God has spoken in such a way in your heart, you just settle down and go like, I got it. That, see, that happened to Paul, didn't it? If you study 2 Corinthians 12, it happened to Paul. That's the participle. The participle of undeserved suffering is to bring your focus in on something that the Word of God is going to go that's going to take some of the old man out, put some of the new man out, rearrange and all that. It's perirasmos pushing you towards a goal, always towards a goal of dokimos. Something really good is going to develop and come out of this to your soul. When, you may not realize how important it is until you step away from it two or three years later and look back and say, oh, wow. Oh, wow. It's present active participle of knowing. Now, here's what's interesting. Here's the grammar. See the word produce? Faith. Knowing, knowing, knowing that your faith produces. Knowing and producing are connected. The action of a present participle occurs at the same time of a present indicative. Notice that the word produce is a present indicative. That present tense on the participle and the present tense on the infinitive means that the action of everything that's going on between the participle and the infinitive is dynamic to the Christian life. Knowing is important to producing, but what's going on in the life? That faith, energetically, God is working faith, working that faith out through perirosmos into dokimas into a goal that will develop your life and push you forward in something bigger and better for God. That's a powerful idea. So you should embrace this stuff. I used to talk about a snowball going down a hill. In fact, Simro still talks about it. 
In fact, when you talk to him about, th about undeserved suffering, he refers to a snowball. Because in my early days, I used to say, you start a little snowball on top of a hill, you know, about that big, and s roll that sucker to the bottom, it'll cover a car if the hill's big enough. The bigger the hill, the better the ball. The bigger the ball. And I used to say, you know that's, that's coming on your life. Watch out, that snowball is rolling towards you. Be prepared when it gets there. Be prepared to make that to bottom and say, bring it on. I'm making me a snowman rather than an avalanche. Knowing works at the same time as producing. Knowing that faith wor worketh endurance. Knowing that the testing, the dokimon or dokimas as we refer to it, is like each stage you pass, you've reached that goal, and now you move forward, as I described it before. It's producing patient endurance. Listen, that ought to be your goal. That's why you go to the gym. That's why you go to get your education, get your degree or whatever. That's the reason you go. You go because what it's producing. That's your goal. You graduate, then hope you can find a job that's correlated to your work, to your degree. And if it isn't, then you adjust. You adjust. Listen, in the plan of God, God is always setting something better in front of you. The good, when God gets engaged in your life and you buy into all things work together for good, it gets better. Come on now. I hope I'm speaking to the choir. It gets better. The good always gets better. See, that's the principle of Romans 8, 28. And what are we doing? We're working under stress. We're working under stress. That's why, that's why it's called faith produces patient endurance. Who put one A? Knowing, point four, knowing is developing spiritual growth maturity in the Christian way of life through undeserved suffering, pushing us to something better than what we have, pushing us somewhere else. And you know what it is? It, it's developing. That snowball is developing. We're being transformed into the image of Christ. You need to have that image developed and settled before you ever leave this world. For example, Jesus Christ comes into the world to, to, uh, to, uh, in the image of God, right? He develops a spiritual growth maturity so that there's no difference between his flesh and his soul in God. So that he can say over here, you have seen me, you have seen God. He was that person at birth. This is the birth of the Son of God. He developed through spiritual growth maturity to become transformation into the image of God Himself. How about that? So that when you saw Him with spiritual eyes of the soul, when you saw spiritually Him, you saw God in the flesh. We are born to the image of Christ, and in transformation, we come into that, and when people see you, they see Christ. Think about that for a moment. And God in your life is putting you through trials and testings, he puts you through a little, and then he rewards you. And it, it, he's made you, he's taking you from good to better. And then he puts you through some testing some more. 
always working towards transforming you into the person of Christ so that in your flesh and soul, they are so one, they're inseparable. We call that super grace maturity. And the first person will know you're there is you. Because when you look in the mirror with your eyes of your soul, you will see the character of Christ. And it will be normal. I guess I just left the audience, John, and came back. So, look, how does this whole thing work in my life? Faith working. How does that work? It's a faith cycle. You see the faith cycle? It's a circle. Hearing. Hearing comes from the word of God. Believing. Applying. Completing. On that circle, on your paper, take a line and split between hearing and believing. Take a line and go right down through that. On one side should be hearing and believing. On the other side of that line should be applying and completing. You got that? Do I have to come down there and draw that line? You see that line? Now watch this. On the hearing, believing side, put knowing. That's the knowing side. There's got to be a knowing side. Knowing that your faith works patient endurance. There's got to be a knowing side. Now look, on the other side, that applying and completing side, listen, put joy. That's the joy side. Because when you're going through that testing and you know what God is trying to do in your life, that he's trying to bring you into a better place in your relationship with him, and he's trying to transform you into the image, Romans 12, chapter verse 2, trying to transform you into the image of Christ, and he's doing all this work in your soul where you're participating off with the old man, on with the new man, walking in the power of the Spirit, taking in the word of God. And listen, you know that you are growing. Right, Robert? You know you're growing. I'm still overwhelmed with all I hear, Ron. I know that, Ron. But I know I'm growing. I'm getting something. And so you are. And God is making a better man out of you. And it's a progression going on until that better man is called Jesus Christ in you. And others will see his character developed in your life. Will see the character. You're no longer the character you used to be. Now I want you to do another thing. Point five. I want you to circle two things. I want you to circle two things. I, the first thing I want you to do, I want you to circle the other command, the imperative mood. Do you see it? It's underlined. See the first thing underlined on your paper? Have, which is echo, present active imperative. See that? Circle that. And the second circle is right next to it. Listen to what it says. Let endurance, let patient endurance have, that's a command. It's a standing command. It's a present imperative. That's a command. Having, watch this now, it's perfect result. Circle perfect result. Because God is now, you see, patient endurance is that process of going through. And now teleos is I've come into my goal. Dokimas, dokimas, patient endurance is going to take me to a place of dokimas. Dokimas is going to open a whole new world to me. I've graduated from pre-law. I'm in, I'm in law school. I've graduated from law school. I'm ready to take the bar exam. Each time, a doki mouse opens a whole new world with God for you, a whole, new, a whole new realm of being transformed into the image of Christ and the plan of God that's pushing you towards something. Oh, man, I'm telling you. The second commandment, the second commandment, is teleos. 
and it's ergon. It's teleos ergon. Teleos. Teleos is used two times, two times in that one verse. It's used two times in that one verse to connect them. It's used five times in James. James 1, 4 is used twice, and then 17, 25, and 3, 2. So he says, now look what I ask you. Write how we achieve patient endurance. Testing of faith, agreed? How do we get it? The testing of faith produces. And the knowing is connected to the producing. Agreed? How do we achieve patient endurance? The testing of your faith produces hupomone. Write how the believer, write, and, and listen, and listen, here's what it tells you. And, and when you get to hupomone, it opens, that's, that's dokimas, opens a whole other world to you. It's called the, it's called the perfect work. It's called teleos ergon. Teleos ergon. In other words, hupomone puts you into dokimas graduation and opens up a whole new other realm, which is called, it has perfect work. Has its perfect work. Doki, doki, uh, uh, hupotaso is going to take you to another stage, open up a whole other door of another stage of development. Spiritual develop in your life. How do we achieve? How, right? How the believer is engaged in the results of the works of patient. In other words, what part of the faith cycle? Now you're on the part where applying and uh, completing. Do you understand that? Where we are on the chart of the faith cycle, where we are in that faith cycle, cycle where where. Where, he, where we have graduated into another realm. Down there, we're on the realm, not knowing realm. We're on the realm of actually living it out to completion. We are applying that word. We are, we are walking it out. This is where the joy side comes. We are walking it out. We're no longer in a classroom studying it. We are actually in the life classroom of living it out. And it's important that you understand that, that there is a knowing side and there is a living side. It all involves faith, but there's one part where you learn it and the other part where you live it. There is a, uh, the life part is on the application and the completing. Let patient endurance have its perfect work. That, you know what that means? Look, look up there on the word, see the faith cycle, look at the word completing. I'm going to show you what this means. See the word completing? That's when you, when you, when you bring, you, you walk that faith and that specific doctrine, you walk it right out to where God says it's a done deal. Listen, there's always going to be a tetateliastai. There's always going to be, when you get to the completion state of faith where God is telling you to walk that thing out, there's going to be, it is finished business. I'm not talking about dying. I'm talking about that exercise God has you in. And I'm ready to take the bar exam, or I have just taken the bar exam. Notice what I wrote. Your faith has been made perfect. It has run the course to completion. And God says, Teleastai, it is finished. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. You have run the race to the finish line. You have fought the fight to the last round. You have won it. There it is. Whoa. My goodness, people. You have no idea the privilege that you have today to sit here and hear this. You are privileged people. This is a magnificent word from the word of God to your life. Watch the benefits come from when you reach the completed stage, when you reach that completed stage of completion to teleestai, that you now have faith worked perfect or complete, he tells you three things. You get three things. Here's the blessings. Here, you get three blessings. Watch what he says. Watch what he says. So that this command 
to hang in there, hang in there, hang in there until you bring that into completion where God says, well done, thy faithful servant. Job well done. You've run that race. You've done, you, right? Whatever it is. Listen, so that, that's Hina with a, I mean, which is an absolute status quo verb, and it's a subjunctive again. So that, this is why. This is why you take the faith rest always to completion, always to, always to the finish line. So that, watch this now, so that you may be absolute status quo, that you may be perfect, teleos, that you maintain that side, that's reach super grace and maintain it to die in grace, that you hold that status Hold that status of teleos, now that you've learned how it works. Hold that status. And then the word complete. It's made up of two words. That word complete is made up, of, and where, that's where you get holistic. It means that you are now matured. You are now maturing as a believer. Oh, this is so good. Please don't miss this. You have now reached a place of spiritual maturity in your life. You have hung on to God, and God has brought you through some of the toughest times with joy in your heart. And now he's going to work. When you study the word of God after this, when you study the word of God, the word of God is going to affect all three parts of your body at one time. Holistic is 1 Thessalonians 5.23. We are a body, soul, and spirit. And when the Word of God works in your life now, it's going to work all that way. It's going to work to your soul, to your body, and to your spirit. And there will be great healing, holistic healing in your life as you've never, ever known it. He combined the word holistic with the word strong. That's the benefit of reaching spiritual maturity and maintaining it by the faith cycle in your life. Always pushing forward. No matter what God puts you in, He's moving you towards another better place in your life in the plan of God. I'm about worn out. I have earned, I have earned my pay today. I'll tell you. And this is an absolute status quo verb of existence. When he says, so that you may be, nah, -uh, so that you will be, that's an absolute status quo verb of spiritual maturity. Hold that to dying grace. Because he will make you whole here. And when you begin to function where the word of God, listen, when the word of God, listen, you don't have to pray for healing, the word of God will heal you. You don't pray for any of this stuff. You don't pray for it. You don't pray, oh, God, make me smarter, make me wiser. This, that's a baby prayer. This stuff now, this stuff works. When the word of God goes in, it goes healing to the soul, healing to the body, healing to the spirit. I used to be a nervous wreck. I'm no longer a nervous wreck. What's happened, Ron? You've become holistic. Maturity has brought you to a place when the word of God goes in your soul. It goes into your soul as far as intelligence. It goes into your soul. It goes into your body as far as health. It health in your soul, health in your body, health in your spirit. You're a healthy whole being. I got to quit. Let me take me to the hospital. I promise you, if you will get one-tenth of what I told you today, it will revolutionize your life. I got to go home and take a shower. <laughs> We're going to have a word of prayer. Then Rick's going to take us out with a pledge. How sad this Sunday is for me. With 17 children slain in the school of America. They want to take guns away, and they want to take this away and that away. You know what they've done? They took God away. 
They took God away from our schools. They took God away. And this is the result of when you take God out of a community, when you take him out of a school, when you take him out of the streets, when you take him out of the public square, this is what you get. And we need to be bold and take it back out there. We need to be bold and take it right back out there. Or you're going to see more of this. This is evil. And God is the answer. And he shouldn't always show up at a school because there's a funeral. He ought to be able to show up when classes are going on, not when the funeral's on. Well, geez, that's another sermon for another day. <laughs> Al closes in a word of prayer, and then Rick will take us out. Heavenly Father, what a great message. What a great opportunity that we have to grow in grace and become like Christ. Father, he never had an old man belief system to take off. We do. Give us wisdom about what must re be removed from our life and what must be replaced in our life. And give us the courage, Father, to not just simply sit and listen, but to live. To believe to live. As we've heard so eloquently today with power, Father, with passion. I just pray, Lord, that you put it in our hearts to live this out and to share this with everyone that we meet. We love you, Father. We thank you for this in Christ's name.